I've built many things over the years, and I think this guitar is one of my favorites. Stick around, and I'm going to give you a reason to keep hoarding all of those scraps and cutoffs. You'll also see how I disguise my intrusive thoughts as creative design. These are all cutoffs and scraps from prior builds that have been sitting in my shop for a while. In fact, the only wood I purchased for this build was this curly maple. This piece of walnut has some crazy figure to it and I thought it would make the perfect bookmatch top. It was from an old project where I just flattened it, slapped some poly on it, and drilled some holes to hang a vest. The first thing I had to do was remove all of the finish and get it milled square to bookmatch. I know it's common in the woodworking community to hang on to any and all pieces of wood, especially if it's something nice like exotics. I've had this walnut for over four years and it wasn't until recently that I realized its true purpose. Unfortunately, most wood in my shop has a true purpose of being a lesson through wasteful mistakes, and I was determined to not make that the case this time, although I came close quite a bit. If you look closely, you could see the holes I previously drilled and now have to work around. It's annoying because I wanted to lay the guitar a certain way and they prevented me from doing so. If you've ever thought about making a guitar but aren't sure of yourself, I'd say go for it. If you have any bit of a woodworking background, you can make a guitar. Sure, there are expensive tools that make it easier, but it's still just woodworking. I found it's becoming harder to choose the overall design of the guitar rather than make them themselves. There are millions of guitars out there and I want mine to stand out from the rest, which requires a bit of courage or stupidity in my case. One of the things I'm thinking will make this guitar stand out is the wood color and hardware choices. I spent a few years in the Marine Corps when I was much younger and I've always loved the token color theme, Scarlet and Gold. I was hoping to achieve this theme with the red undertones of the walnut, some red pet alk, and gold hardware. The maple, when finished, should hopefully add some of that desert tan color along with the black and brown accents in the walnut for the woodland camouflage. You can see here when my center line is aligned with this book match, the panel isn't wide enough. To fix this, I took some creative liberties and decided to add this pet alk in the middle along with some strips of maple later on. To make the body a bit thicker, I'm going to add this slab cutoff of Catalpa. It's an interesting wood, and to be honest, I'd love to make an acoustic top out of it one day. It's a soft wood, and somewhat similar to Spanish cedar. Robust, strong, and extremely durable. It even smells kind of sweet. And just like everything else, this will be thinned down through book matching and glued up as a panel. Let's skip ahead because if you've seen one panel glue up, you've seen them all. I'm cleaning the glue with the card scraper here to make the body seamless for a big wood sandwich. I like wood sandwiches. This one gave me a damn headache though. Whenever I make wood sandwiches, I like to use a vacuum press because it's typically the easiest way to get equal pressure across the surface. To keep from slipping around, I placed 23 gauge nails at the front and back where I knew the guitar template wouldn't lay. After throwing it in the press, I started to notice the edges weren't completely clamped, causing me to go into an anxiety-induced spiral to come up with a solution. And this was my solution. Literally every heavy-duty parallel clamp I owned. And it worked. If you own a bandsaw, you know how much of a bitch it is to change these damn blades. So instead of swapping it out for something that can take sharper turns, I slotted this thing out piece by piece getting as close as I could to the guitar shape drawn on top as possible. I'm going with the standard Paul Reed Smith body style with a bolt-on neck, but I'll be doing some crazy stuff to it later. I'm not trying to get sued for making a knockoff. I've always been a fan of PRS guitars. They play well, sound good, and are mostly always beautiful pieces of artwork. If there are any guitar players watching this, I'd be curious on your thoughts of PRS guitars especially if you have a different opinion or preference in brand or style. Let me know in the comments. After the body shape was completed, I couldn't resist a grain reveal. Check out this intense array of figure and colors. It's moments like this that get you addicted to woodworking. And a quick little back shot to hold you over until it's done.
Some standard black CA glue was used to fill a couple voids, and no, I don't think it hurts tone. I've learned tone comes from pickups, amplifiers, playability, and setup when it comes to electric guitars. Other than beauty, I've never noticed a difference in the type of wood chosen when it came to tone. To save some stress on my pattern bits, I cleared out some space for the neck pocket and pickup wells at the drill press. I made sure not to go too deep so the little pointy part of the Forstner bit doesn't leave holes that can't be cleaned up by the router. I honestly forgot the depth here, but I remember it needed to be deep enough for the fretboard to sit above the body by about one quarter of an inch. And the pickup wells needed enough space for additional wiring to sit under the pickups. Now it's time to cue those intrusive thoughts I confuse with creative design choices. If you remember, I said I wanted this guitar to stand out from the rest. Nothing in my mind would make it stand out more than hacking off the bottom of it. For reference, I used a 5 gallon bucket lid to determine the radius here. My goal was to blend hard chamfers with soft roundovers. The best way to achieve this was to chamfer the entire guitar first, then determine where the blending would occur. Most blending was done with a combination of hand tools. I used rasps, block planes, hand saws, sandpaper, chisels, gouges, and card scrapers to get a desired look. And this took forever. More intrusive thoughts won as I just kept carving away at this thing, hating it the more I worked on it and because I had no real plan in place. I just wanted different. And sometimes different gets bullied in high school. In fact, I messed it up so bad, I just routed it all away with a template made from another 5-gallon bucket lid radius again. Which was absolutely ruined when I flipped it over and routed out the electronics pocket. My dumbass decided to go too low and route a hole through the opening of the cutout. I was so pissed that I didn't even film setting up the fix. I cut a thin strip of padaukan maple to hide the hole showing through. I boiled both of them in water on the stove so they could bend and make the radius of the cutout. I'd be lying if I said this mistake didn't actually make the guitar better. After getting these trimmed down, they gave a cooler partial binding look. I don't know about you, but I'm no stranger to mistakes determining the design choices on most of my builds. I started to get these flush, but the transition wasn't perfect, so I decided to move on and come back to it later. Cue the next mistake. I used a boring bit instead of a Forstner bit and created a massive blowout in the corner for the jack plate hole. I had no idea how to fix it so I just started on the neck to keep myself from throwing it in the fire. I made this neck template back when I had a CNC. Most people find the neck to be the most daunting task in guitar building but it's not too crazy. The most important things are scale length and maintaining an accurate center line. Everything else will just fall into place. I like acrylic templates because it allows me to be picky with the grain selection. You can see here where the grain kind of just flows across the headstock like hair, or water, or the essence of pure hate for boring bits blowing out massive chips in your guitar. I really can't believe I did that. Like seriously how stupid of me. It's not even the first time I did that either. I had the same issue on the first guitar I ever built and you think I would have learned my lesson. Damn it. Okay, I said we were moving on and we are. This channel was cut down the center line for the truss rod. It's important to get the width and height extremely accurate so the truss rod can do its job. If it's too deep or too wide, then there's too much room causing the truss rod to clank around in the neck and not be as effective in straightening it. If it's too tight or not deep enough, the rod can buckle under pressure and the fretboard won't glue properly. No biggie. Remember, you can always reach near perfection with a hammer or fire. No such thing as imperfect ashes. Guitar necks are cool, but they're useless without a super sick curly maple fretboard. One thing I've learned about my preference in design is contrast creates beauty. A super light maple fretboard to contrast the walnut was the obvious choice. I drew a line around the presenting figure I wanted the most on the fretboard and milled the wood around it before resawing it into about a quarter inch thick board. This is that part where someone says, Man, your hand is way too close to the blade, you're going to cut your ear off. Anyways, 
With all fingers intact, I moved to cutting the fret slots. A great cheat code for this is a solid miter box and template. Those little notches slip into a little thingy in the miter box, perfectly spacing each fret to your desired scale length. If you don't want to spend money on one, you could just print out a paper template or measure the old fashioned way. I always cut fret slots a bit deeper than the tang for reasons you'll find out later on. By the way, this double sided tape is intensely strong and you should probably get some. I'll leave a link below. For glue up, I taped off the truss rod to keep the glue from seeping in and causing it to buckle or lock up. Yes, the fretboard will still hold well. And just like the body, I pinned it in place before using a shit ton of clamps to apply pressure. If you ever want to feel weak, use 12 heavy duty parallel clamps to clamp something small, then try to pick up said small thing. Just like everything else, I removed the bulk of the material at the bandsaw and used a pattern bit to flush the piece up to the template. The neck with the fretboard attached is supposed to be about one inch thick, so I resawed the blank into two pieces, leaving another pre-cut neck for a future build. Or I'll send it to the 100th commenter for free. Some guitar headstocks can be as thin as half an inch, but it's important to maintain strength against the string pressure. And I still ended up with a headstock that was just over half an inch. These spindle sanders are perfect for cleaning hard to reach bandsaw marks and they even work well as a thicknesser of sorts when paired with the square fence like this. Look at all that dust. Back to another crazy design choice. I wanted more red from the pedalk to be seen from the front so I thought it would be perfect fretboard binding to contrast the maple. I used a small rabbiting bit to cut a channel for the binding, taking small little chunks at a time while leaving just a sliver of maple to be visible after glue up. To make the binding I just cut two long, thin, and skinny strips of pedalk. The thinner they are, the easier to bend at the headstock transition. Speaking of bending, let's take a lunch break. Man, this video is full of great food, ain't it? Wood sandwiches and padauk noodles are the best. In all seriousness, this is a quick way to bend small pieces of wood without an actual steamer set up. You can see I have it pre-clamped so it dries in position, making glue up easier. I had my buddy Sean help me out with this part because four hands are better than two, but these pencils stole the show as their corner radius was perfect for the curvature. Okay, I'll hold my breath and stop talking for a minute so you can hear some satisfying woodworking sounds. Okay, here I am. I've never been a fan of standard fret dots on a guitar, so I wanted to add something unique. You know, the whole standout from the rest portion. I figured 1 8 inch brass rod would be a cool addition as fret dots. Problem is, cutting small slivers of skinny brass rod is either extremely time consuming or extremely dangerous. I went with the dangerous route because I'm impatient. To make it less dangerous, I routed a cove down the middle of some plywood and put tape over the rod. Then I placed a second piece of plywood over the taped rod to keep things from flying around on the miter saw and it actually worked out quite well. The top plywood kept downward pressure while the tape prevented the piece from becoming a lethal projectile. And as you can see, this worked quite well to batch out all of these quickly and safely. Using CA glue and a hammer for perfection, I crammed these suckers into place one by one until the whole thing was done. I didn't have a soft hammer that was heavy enough to knock these into place, so I may or may not have dented the fretboard while doing this. Getting them flush wasn't too hard either. I just hacked away with a hacksaw and used that pencil again to apply inward pressure because the brass gets really hot when you cut it. 
I feel like I've been burned by hot metal in my wood shop more than I've been cut by sharp blades or splinters. I have a tendency to grab screws right after they've been torqued out of something, and that freaking burns. Just in case you do plan on getting into guitar building, I'd recommend getting a wide array of rasps and vials. Not only am I using them here to flush up the brass, but they're a godsend when shaping and contouring the neck and body. Here's an overview of the neck progress. I really like how the brass turned out. You see in the background a board I joined it with sandpaper stuck to it. I used it not only to straighten the neck a little more, but to get a final brushed brass look on the inlays. If you've seen my other guitar builds, you've seen this massive table edge profile bit. I always use it to remove the bulk of material from the neck evenly and to get an initial shape. I stuck the plywood I stuck the plywood scraps on the edges to use as guides to not go too far for the headstock or the heel. I always prefer to do this transition by hand. It just looks so much more organic and comfortable this way. By the way, these goldish colored rasps are the best I've ever used and they're actually the cheapest out of my collection. You can get a set of four for less than 20 bucks I believe. They remove materials so quick. I'm a get in and get it done quick kind of guy. So any tool that speeds up my process like this is welcome in my shop. Most guitar necks have some sort of radius to them for comfort. I chose to go with a 12 inch radius for mine. It's a decent standard for most. This metal block has a 12 inch radius that I attached sandpaper to and sanded until the fretboard was fully radiused. I used this same block to measure the radius of the frets as I ran them through a fret bender wheel thing. Once the fret radius was bent, I cut them all a little oversized and separated them accordingly. This next part made me feel like the man Jimmy Diresta himself. Standard fret tang nippers cost up to $80. So I saved my money by spending $10 on these end snippers and dremeling a channel for the fret to sit in. This allowed me to nip the fret tangs on the end so they could be hidden behind the binding. After that, I hammered and pressed the frets in one by one then snipped them with end cutters to flush them up at the neck. To protect the fretboard from absorbing CA glue, I waxed it with some standard paste wax. This prevents CA glue from changing the color by seeping too deep into the maple. If you do your frets right, CA glue isn't necessarily needed, but I'm not taking any chances. What you see here is another stroke of genius utilizing scrap wood. I cut a channel in this oak to file the fret ends to begin dressing them. Sometimes I have more fun building jigs like this than I do actually making projects. It's satisfying to create your own knockoff tools and give a big middle finger to the price gouging companies that charge you 150 bucks for something they had made in China for 50 cents. The paste wax was removed with mineral spirits and I scraped the remaining CA glue away with a razor. Razors aren't just for emo kits or cardboard boxes. They're great little finish scrapers too. I skipped this step on my last guitar build and regret it completely. Leveling and crowning frets is so necessary. Using a marker, I colored the top of the frets to check for even removal. I joined another board and put 180 grit sandpaper on it to use as a fret leveler. Following the radius of the board, I slowly sanded until all of the marker was gone. When you level frets, the top of them gets flat and they need to be rounded. This fret crowning file is one of the only necessary tools you need for guitar building. It rounds them over perfectly and helps you remove the sharp fret ends. Okay, I'm going to shut up again and just let you watch for a second.
Does anyone else feel like one of those old school, super cool woodworkers anytime they use a chisel? I do. Look at these little curls coming off the nut slot. I could do this all day, literally. You know it's sharp when it effortlessly curls maple like this. I also like turning my chisel upside down to shape things. A standard chamfer wouldn't be enough for me, so I tackled it by hand to create some dimension. These details are the small things that I believe make a project stand out even more. Now that the neck is done, let's check out the fit. I purposely left out the hours and hours of sanding. Just know that I did do it and properly prepared for finish. Speaking of finish, check this out and try not to drool. Although finish has been applied to the neck, we're not done yet. It's time for hardware, electronics, and to fix that cut out at the bottom of the guitar before adding finish to the body. There are special tools for installing tuners, but you already know how I feel about a good old fashioned hammer. I like to get all the holes pre-drilled and copper tape installed before adding finish as well. This decreases the likelihood that I'll destroy it after all that hard work. To fix the cutout, I'm doing something I've never seen done on a guitar. When in doubt, flock it out. Flocking material, is, flocking material is super cool when you want to cover up hideous mistakes while also adding a sexy suede texture. I like to remove the tape immediately because the glue here can stain like crazy, but can also be easily removed with mineral spirits. All right, here's some more sexy time. Perfect, we're in the home stretch. Just installing the hardware and fixing one last mistake. I figured I'd embrace the huge chip out by using leather. I just cut this simple leather strip and placed it underneath the jack plate. If you like how this turned out, make sure to like and subscribe, click that notification thing, and check out some of my other videos. Now here's the moment you've all been waiting for. Mm -hmm.